To be a disciple of Jesus, I pointed out last week, is to be a follower of his. And to be a follower of Jesus is to confess that he is Lord. That is to say, he is the one ordained of God to restore a fallen and broken world back to God and to all the blessings of his kingdom. It means to spend time with him. It means to learn from him with a view of changing our behavior so that we become like the master. And it means ultimately sharing in his mission to make disciples of all nations. And it is making disciples that Paul and Barnabas are after here in Acts chapter 14 as they wind up their missionary journey. They're not just interested in winning converts. They're interested in winning men and women who are devoted followers of Jesus. And so it is that having reached the end of their first missionary journey, they now turn around and they revisit the cities where they had established churches and had won Christian converts. Listen again to how Acts puts it in that verse that we've read many times together. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We're having a problem getting that slide up but we'll go on. So the question that we've been considering together is the question, how do they go about strengthening and encouraging the disciples? Remember, they lived in a hostile world. All three of the cities that they're visiting, uh, they had tried to get rid of Paul, and one of them, they had tried to kill him. How do you keep believers going in that kind of a hostile environment? Well, as I've pointed out, in these short verses that we've read together, there are, in fact, three strategies that the Apostle Paul follows to strengthen and to encourage the disciples. And so far, we have started to look at the first of them. And that is this. He gives a very realistic picture of the Christian life. He gives them a very realistic picture of the Christian life. He says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And so far we have identified, we have looked at one of three reasons why it is through many hardships that we enter the kingdom of God. The first reason is because the gate is narrow. And the verse that we reference is Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. And if we can get this picture back up, this is, of course, the picture that we were looking at last week. It is the classic illustration of the broad road and the narrow road. And since last week, I did a little further investigation as to the history of this. And the history is very interesting because it was first published in 1886 in Stuttgart, Germany. And the artist was Paul Beckman, but the art was commissioned by a rich merchant woman by the name of Charlotte Rylan. Now, Charlotte was the daughter of a preacher, but had drifted away from the faith and in the early years of her marriage had lived a pretty worldly life. Uh, She got married. She had a number of children. After her third child was born, her second child, age two, took sick and died. She viewed that as God's correcting discipline in her life. And so she 
uh, turned back to the faith of her youth and gave herself to the Lord and became actively involved in evangelism. And as part of engaging in evangelism, she engaged Paul Beckman to, to draw up this particular picture, uh, modeling uh, the old way of life that she used to live versus the new way of life that she had adopted. And it's a very fascinating history and very telling in terms of her life. Um, the scripture passages that the passage is full, that, that the poster is full of was designed to engage people in conversation. And so we've taken the liberty to uh, produce a smaller version of that poster, and I've put the scripture readings in larger print so that even the oldest among us can read them. But here's what I want to recommend those of you that have families of school age children, particularly. Uh, we have a limited number of copies at both of the desks. Take it home with you. Make a game out of that. Uh, see who can look up a passage the fastest. Read the passage because it is illuminating what scripture passages are referred to in the process of trying to communicate this particular truth. So to carry on from last week, we saw that Each of the two ways has a gate. And the world has a very uh, broad gate that you can see over here. And the kingdom of God has a very narrow gate that you can see on this end. And the reason for the narrow gate, as we saw, is that the broad gate, let me back up and say that the broad gate... All you have to do is be born into the world and live a natural life and you're automatically on the wrong road. You don't have to do anything to be wrong. It comes naturally. But to get through the narrow gate, you've got to come to Jesus. You've got to come through faith and you have to leave all your sin behind and everything else that you find your identity in and that is extremely difficult sometimes and that is why entering into the kingdom for many people is difficult. So Jesus puts it this way, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Don't know about you, but I've always found those to be exceedingly sobering words. Think of Lot's wife, so attached to Sodom, she couldn't bear to leave it behind. Think of the five foolish virgins who were awaiting the coming of the bridegroom, but they didn't have enough oil, they weren't prepared, and they got locked out of the kingdom. Think of the rich young ruler couldn't part with his wealth and therefore turned his back on the coming of God's kingdom. Well, that's where we pick it up this morning. Not only is the gate into the kingdom very narrow, so, says Jesus, is the road. The road is narrow as well. And the verse, again, small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And that, of course, stands in sharp contrast to the previous verse, wide is the gate, if we can put that slide up, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. So again, notice, you have a broad gate and you have a narrow gate, and then the broad gate leads to a wide road, and the narrow gate leads to a narrow road. Keep that picture up for just a moment, and let me point out a number of the features of the broad road. Last week, I pointed out a number of them, a dance hall, a casino, and a theater, but there's subtle nuances in there that you almost need a magnifying glass to be able to try to find. And here's one of them. You can't read that possibly from back there, but on this pillar 
that holds up the welcome sign is the name Bacchus. Let me see how much you know about ancient mythology. Anybody remember who Bacchus is? That's right. He was the god of wine, merrymaking, and partying. He was the one responsible for putting people under the influence of the wrong spirit. And so you can't see it very well here, but this is a drinking party over on this side. Over here on this pillar, you find the name Venus, the goddess of sex, beauty, and all of that kind of thing. So right behind that pillar is a lady of the night propositioning this man. So there you see values of the word, lust of the eyes, the, the pride of life, and, and the lust of the flesh. And then, of course, here's a guy who is beating the snot out of his donkey. Uh, here are people engaged in buying and selling. Uh, here's the lottery over here. Here's a guy being held up and nations at war over on this end, and of course, the Sunday train, which, as I said last week, must have been a big issue uh, back in those days to place it that close to the fires of hell, you know. Um, that's a, an interesting uh, little aside. Um, it's interesting, just for your information, that... Uh, Let me just move that along to the next one. I've got to show you this one. The next picture, please. There's something with my clicker today that's given us trouble up there. Um, here is a new version of the broad and the narrow way. A number of years ago, a preacher in a setting such as this, in fact, a church called Maranatha Church in the Netherlands put a challenge out to his congregation for somebody to come up with a new version. So two men took him up on that. They engaged the services of an artist, and this is what they came up with. And uh, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but you can't help but notice that's a rather huge golden calf. Uh, over here, somebody's watching a big screen TV. Uh, a pretty bare lady there, uh, just for the record. Here's a guy trying to entice him in. I like this little choir uh, doing their little evangelism in front of the narrow gate. Uh, here you have your drinking party again. Here is the house of prostitution. These people are dancing. This lady is coming out of the supermarket, uh, which is open seven days a week. And uh, what I like is, is this church, which is half underwater. And I think the point is that this is a church that waters down the gospel. And over here is a guy in black who represents uh, the magical powers of darkness. And of course, uh, you can't see the forest for the trees. And the intent of that is to put it in the hands of young people to have conversations together about the Broadway versus the narrow way. So, in contradistinction to that is, of course, the narrow road. If we can have that slide back up, please. The narrow road, um, let me point out some of its features because they're also very interesting. There's, of course, the fountain of water where you draw life from Jesus. Uh, but over here is a church building because one of the first things that happens when you come to faith in Christ is you begin to share in the life of God's people and you're drawn together. Over here is a Sunday school. Not sure what the little bridge represents. That verse says that Jesus is the way. I suspect the water represents the waters of baptism. But particularly interesting are these three buildings. Because this is a hospitality tent, a cup of cold water, given in the name of the Lord. This is, in fact, I'm pretty sure an orphanage, and this is a, a deaconess building. And there's an interesting history to that, because uh, Charlotte Ryland was instrumental 
in building a place in Stuttgart, an institute for taking care of the poor. And at the highest point of its history in the 1920s, they had 1,200 women uh, living in there. And, uh, you know, from, from our kind of terminology, it's almost like a hospital or a place of respite for people who are uh, in trouble. So the path starts rather steeply because the Christian life is a climb up when you first get into it. Then there's sort of a meandering path, which is a fairly easy road, but then watch this one on the way to the eternal city. Think of, you know, Hannah Hernard's book, Hind's Feet on Hind Places, if you've ever read it, or Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, you meet up with a roaring lion up there, and, and life in the kingdom cannot be lived in natural strength. The road is narrow and the way is hard because it can only happen through union with Christ. And Paul puts it this way in Galatians chapter five. He says, but by faith, we eagerly await through the spirit, the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So you've got two gates, a wide gate, a narrow gate, a wide road, and a narrow road. And we enter into the kingdom of God through many hardships because we have to leave behind all the flesh, all our own uh, areas of glory, and in the surrender to Jesus, we walk out the journey. And if the world is characterized by the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, the kingdom of God is characterized by the qualities of faith, hope, and love. So there you have the first two reasons that I'm giving you out of this passage why through many hardships we enter into the kingdom of God. But there's a third one, and that is that God uses suffering, particularly he uses persecution to refine the church. And if we can move these slides along, please, then we will come to verse John 15, verse 20. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And Paul echoes that same thought in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 when he says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And the question is, of course, why does God allow that to happen there are many answers, but one of the answers is that God uses the sufferings produced by persecution to refine us as through fire. Peter, in 1 Peter 1, the verses 6 and 7, puts it this way, For a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Graphically, we can picture it this way, if we can get that next slide up. We, the kingdom of God, is the holiness of God. And we sang about that earlier this morning. God is so holy that, that he cannot tolerate anything that falls short of his standard. He wants to share his glory with us. But for him to share his glory with us, we have to leave behind us all this that interferes with the presence and the power and the holiness of God. And when by faith we're joined to Jesus, positionally, as you know, we're placed over here. 
But in reality, there is still very much this a part of our life. And sometimes the bad things that cling to us, we can sort of put them off and, and, and we, we can live the new life. But you know just as well as I do, that as long as we're in the here and now, uh, time and time again, uh, the, the pride of life, uh, the lust of the eyes, the, the lust of the flesh, we get overtaken by it. And, and all the... You know, you look at the history of Old Testament Israel, you look at the history of the New Testament church, uh, many times we have to go through the fire in order to be refined, to let go of the things that we hold on to so dearly. And so Peter, again, uh, later on in 1 Peter 4 verse 1, puts it this way, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And so far in the Western world, you and I, you know, we haven't known a lot of persecution other than maybe, you know, somebody makes fun of us because we go to church or somebody makes fun of us because we don't participate with them in their particular behaviors. But mostly we're pretty free to do what we want to do, aren't we? But that's changing, of course. Because as our society in a wholesale way uh, rejects the values of the kingdom, the the resistance towards faith and towards people of faith is becoming more and more pronounced. I uh, don't know how many of you know the journey that Trinity Western University out in BC is going through. A number of years ago, they ran into a lot of trouble because they wanted to get their teachers accredited. That had to go all the way to the Supreme Court because teachers' unions were fighting them on uh, faith and behavior issues. And the same thing has surfaced again now because in the year 2016, Trinity Western University wants to open a law school. And so far, the Ontario Bar Association and the Nova Scotia Bar Association have both gone on record as saying they will not accredit their graduates. And the reason is that every student that attends Trinity Western University, which is of course a Christian university, has to sign a covenant agreeing to abstain from sexual intimacy that, quote, violates the sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman, unquote. And you can imagine where that goes in today's society. And so the argument is we don't want you training lawyers because we don't trust that they will treat everybody equally. So Trinity Western has just gone to court and have launched a lawsuit to try to address that particular issue because if you look at the history of societies that, that persecute Christians, it never starts by killing Christians. It starts by you're gonna lose your job. It starts by you're not going to get your promotion. It starts by, we're going to box you in. And as I said earlier, what is happening in China now is that China goes through these, these waves of, uh, these waves of, of persecution where sometimes they really let up the pressure and the church just really flourishes. And then when uh, Christians become too high profile or too threatening, uh, they, they pull the rug out from underneath. And so far, in news reports that I have read, in recent months, they have destroyed 25 major church buildings to try to, to stop the growth of the Christian church. Uh, one of the cities that Weeb and I visited a number of years ago when he and I went to China was the city of Wenxiao. And that is known as the Jerusalem of China because it has a higher percentage of Christians than most any other community. 
And one of the news stories just this past week, that it's a huge nine-story church complex with a huge cross on top. The congregation has been informed to get out because the authorities are going to tear it down. That kind of persecution is not that far from our doors. And when it happens, the question is, can we stand and can we persevere in the ways of God? So three reasons now that I've given you why through many hardships we enter into the kingdom of God. We enter through the narrow gate and you got to leave your pride and your arrogance and in your world behind you. We have to walk the narrow road where we take up our cross and we follow Jesus. And then we face persecution in a world that wants nothing to do with Jesus. So here's the big question. Can you guess what the big question is? Why does anybody want to be a Christian? Because it is not a picnic that we are invited to. It is a crucifixion. And the shoulders we stand on are men and women who have bloodied the paths of history with their sacrificial blood of martyrs. So, why be a Christian? Why stand firm? Well, the answer, of course, you don't have to be too brilliant to figure that one out, is the two gates and the two roads lead to very different destinations. Listen again to the scripture, moving it on to Matthew 7 verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And notice again, if we can go to the next slide, how that is pictured graphically uh, on the poster that we've been looking at together. And we'll do a close-up if we can go to the next slide. Here you see the lake of fire, the destruction wrought by God, the judgment on the ways of the world, and the end goal here is the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. And you can't possibly read uh, the small print that is associated with this, but let me read you some of the verses because it'll give you a handle on, on just how, I don't know how to describe it, just how black and white scripture is on this issue. Deuteronomy 32 verse 22. For a fire has been kindled by my wrath. That's God speaking one that burns to the realm of death below. It will devour the earth in its harvests and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. The next verse, 2 Peter 3.10, same theme. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bear. And there's no way that you'll be able to see that from your distance, but up here, maybe you've got really good eyes, you can see it, is a way scale. Anybody see that right here? The scales of justice. And that comes from the book of Daniel, where Belshazzar, you will recall, is feasting away in his party and the hand of God appears writing on the wall, mena, mena, take a our sin, and the word take there means you have been weighed on the scales and you have been found wanting. The clear teaching of scripture is that everybody that has ever lived in the day of the resurrection is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give account of himself or herself. Paul puts it this way, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him, due to him for the things done while in the body, 
whether good or bad. It's the great white throne judgment where God hands out his rewards and his punishment. And the scripture makes it so plain that those who are on the broad road who come to that day of judgment are going to face an absolute lack of mercy. Matthew 25, verse 41, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Sobering words. Because beyond that, there is no longer an avenue of redemption. It is eternal condemnation. And the challenge for people is to not allow themselves to be deceived that somehow or another they can walk the broad road and still God will be kind to them at the very last moment without their repentance. Ephesians 5, 6, 7, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, that is that whole list of the works of the flesh, because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. So on the other side then, if we can move forward, we have the city of God, the new Jerusalem. And one of the references there is the classic Revelation 21, the verses one through four, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Scripture is so very, very clear that for those who enter through the narrow gate by faith in Christ, those who walk the narrow road, taking up their cross, following Jesus, manifesting his character, even in the midst of great persecution, at the end of time, they will receive their reward because they will enter the new Jerusalem, the city of God that God is building. Next verse describes it similarly, Hebrews 12, 22 to 23. You've come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. And again, you may not be able to see it, but all of these are angels blowing their trumpets over here. Again, it's hard to see. Here you have the demons flying around over the darkness. And what's significant to note here is the crown and the palm branches. And that scripture reference is uh, Revelation 3 verse 21 where the Lord Jesus says to the church, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me in my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And then the next verse, Matthew 16, 27, the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Two gates. Wide gate, a narrow gate. Two roads, a wide road, that's easy. A narrow road, that's hard. Two different destinations, the lake of fire or the city of God. Every man, woman, and child in the world, including you and me sitting here, we are on one road or the other. God has given his son 
to make it possible that we move from the one to the other to avoid the destiny of judgment and to experience the blessings of God. But it means we not only have to enter through the narrow gate, it means we have to commit ourselves to walking the narrow path in the confidence that in Christ the journey will be worth our while.